Celtic maintained the five point gap at the top of the table with a 1 0 win over Ross County at the weekend, but does that tell the full picture with growing frustration amongst many of the fans? This is Tino with the Celtic Exchange Weekly, joined here by Miff, James, and Assam to bring you all things Celtic. Miff, I'll come to you first. Where are you at at the moment? Uh, hello, Tino. Hello, Assam. Hello, James. Uh, where am I at? I'm just a bit perplexed, to be honest. I don't really see. I, there's a lot not right for me and, and I know we seem to be as a fan base we seem to be split into two camps those that are saying get a grip of yourself stop being entitled we won three points move on fair enough then the other correct people who say <laughs> you know what's going on things are not right there seems to be an imbalance between the manager the board as to what direction we're going in and it all revolves back to the point, as I've expressed many times before on here, what was the point in bringing Rodgers back if you're not actually going to back him? Because he just looks a bit frustrated. And in turn, we're getting frustrated because the very, very glaring areas of the squad that need support and need improved, it's still not been done. And this is the end of the second transfer window where we could have done something about it. Yeah, and it's almost epitomised by the fact that Alessandro Bernabe takes to the pitch on, on Saturday I don't think he's a guy that should be featuring at all for Celtic at any any time they've got to move guys that come on and I think that's the thing James it's, it's not you know we'll get to the boon I suppose in a wee bit but it, I don't think the boon was specifically about the performance albeit a pretty abject performance but I think it's more about the bigger picture at Celtic it's the lack of signings it's the lack of support for the manager it's it's all sorts of things going on, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I don't see it as entitled at all. I mean, I, for me, the game was, yeah, Turgid should have been better. Should have scored the penalty. Uh, Bernardo should have scored. Plural, plural penalties. Well, I, any one of two. You can only, get, you can only score one of them, I think. Uh, Bernardo should have scored his open goal. But if those two go in, football's a low-scoring game. If those two go in, it's 3-0, we're off to a flyer, blah, blah, blah. Different chat about the game and it's all about the, the wider stuff. And, and that's where I don't see the boon as entitled because Celtic fans are feeling what's going on here and we felt it before and we were right when we felt it before and we're right now and they're doing nothing about it. So what we're trying to do, I suppose, with the boon, and you said before the final whistle, you think this is going to be a boo. Yeah. You felt it coming kind of thing. From you. <laughs> <laughs> I did not partake. Um, but I felt I, you know, I felt the frustration that everyone was booing was. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm not into that. I think that's on a win. That's not, that's not for me. But they can see what the, the club are, are doing or what they're not doing. And I suppose what they're trying to do is, is invoke some action, which has had zero response from the club so far and looks like it'll be nothing between now and Thursday. Yeah, we were chatting on the way through here about the similarities, certainly in terms of the, the feeling around the club that we experienced during the COVID season. And I think we were all booing from our sofas at a safe two metre distance at We're that time on. back in the day. Do you feel there's similar stuff going on though? Not in terms of obviously at that time it was the fact that Neil Lennon wasn't replaced quickly enough as a manager. Do you think though there's there's just this growing concern that there's stuff going on, we can all see it, you know, the, we are top of the league at this moment in time but will that remain the case and all these kind of things? Are you feeling the same vibes as whatever that was now two or three years ago? I think what, maybe not exactly the same vibes but it's in our gift to spend money and romp to this title and we're deciding, no, do you know what, we'll try and do it for as little as possible, or we're having a sideshow fight between the Lowell's camp and the Rogers camps, and it's just, we're in the crossfire, and so are the players, and it's it's absolute <laughs> just to be honest with you, it's, it's just doing my head in. Yeah, I can understand that. Asim, welcome back to the show, great to have you back on. Um, there was an interesting reaction from one of the players in the final whistle, I'm sure you've seen the footage, yeah. but it's Alistair Johnson, he's shaking hands with one of the, the Ross County players, and I'm not sure exactly what he's saying, but you can tell his expression. He's basically, you know, indicating that, geez, we've won here and the guys are still booing. And I'm sure players like him and maybe even more so guys like Nicholas Kuhn are just wondering what's going on. You're five points clear, you've won a game, but it's not just about Saturday, is it? Yeah, I, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Like, I didn't partake either in the booing, but um, I think it's a sign of, of the standards that we expect. And it's good for a lot of this squad because a lot of them are new players. And my worry is a lot of the, the new players don't have that same mentality as the ones that maybe have left in recent times. And it's a, it's a sign for them that, that yeah, you might have won one now, but 
performance wasn't good enough. We've got certain standards that we expect. Um, but as both of the guys have said, I think that was um, a boo towards the bigger picture rather than in isolation. If we have that same performance in victory, maybe five, six games down the line, or it's in the last five games, we'll take it. But it's the fact that it's, you know, we've came off, the, it's strange saying it, we've won six games in a row, we've kept another clean sheet, but you left that game almost as scunnered as you felt after the Hearts defeat. Yeah. And that's a strange feeling, but as James said, it's, Completely because, agree with that. You know, it's, it's a trajectory. We can see where this is going. I remember the St. Johnston away game. We won, but you just felt that a drop point is coming. The following two games, we dropped points. Or uh, two out of the three, I can't remember the order, but we lost at Comar uh, Hearts at home and lost at Kilmarnock. We can see that if we put in another performance like that, Petodre, Easter Road, we're going to go second in the table. So you can just feel it coming. And the, the worrying thing is, they're so inconsistent, you don't know what Celtic you're going to get each week right now. Do we trust this team to to really handle a title race? And I don't know if I do at the moment. Yeah, and Matt's spoken about the fact that to go and win any title, you need to find that consistent run where you go and win eight, nine, ten in a row. And you're right, as much as we're on a, a six-game winning streak, I'm not convinced that Celtic have, have got it in them to go you know, the ten or a dozen games. Just before we carry on, though, Asim's confirmed that he didn't boo. James didn't boo. <laughs> I know I didn't boo. No. No, no, no. No, no you're not that kind of guy. Some hefty, some hefty, tut, tut. Um, hefty size and huffs like, oh. <laughs> jeez, old Palmer. But, um, <laughs> Also encouragement as well because you know the players, the players feel that. And you're, firstly, I, I I would like to say I thought Ross County were excellent. You Just know, su surprise me. Yeah. They, they were yeah. they were brilliant and they they stepped up an extra ten yards than what you normally see at Celtic Park and mm -hmm. they really nullified the quick ball out wide. Just where they had their, their midfielders and and I think that kind of surprised us a wee bit. We didn't have that easy release valve. For the pressure that we normally have, they were trying to make us go a bit more more central. But the issue was that at times McGregor did it. We don't really have MD brave enough to kind of take the ball in the half turn and drive into ten yards of space, and it was really really apparent. Bernardo had won his poorer games, and that I don't think that helped matters either. But I would say the pitch was probably to blame that because that's the areas that were the most rutted. Um, it's it, it's just not a good nick at all. But Sorry, you've mentioned various players there. Matt O'Reilly, he's effectively played on injured. So, what, so what, what does it come to when you're probably your most um, expensive asset at this moment in time? That, you know, if nothing else in terms of you know what he brings on the table, why would you take the risk with him? It was clear it was a thirty, 30 minutes in he's taking that knock. It looked like it troubled him for the whole rest of the game, and the fact that we've already had to take off Carter Vickers at some point in the game. You're going with Burnaby. Are they just too reluctant to lose another key player? Is that where we've got to? You haven't got the options. I, I, I would assume so, but I think it's more to do with the trust he's got in the rest of the squad, and the depth just isn't there. The depth's not there. We, we like to think it is, but it's but it's not. Burnaby's. I, I think it's a. I don't think anyone thinks it. I think they know Bern, it's not. Bernabe, Bernabe's playing left back. You know that that's that that in itself. I mean, the recruitment team should be looking at themselves and go, how how will it get to this? But I don't think they are. Burnaby, I just don't think they are. Burnaby was hilarious. It was, it was actually entertaining to watch yeah. him if you weren't trying to will your team to a win. It was entertaining to watch what he was up to. Just running, running around, around like a headless chicken. And, oh, it was <laughs> mad. He was up there. He was like, oh, my mum maybe were there and just it, to, jogging back to his spot. Uh, my summation of his performance was I think he did as well as we could have expected. I know. We, we, he, we, he, he, he wasn't expecting to not be there though. But he, no, that, he played that, like no, he'd expect. Yeah, I don't expect. think he's any better than that. That's his level. But what would we expect? A guy that's just been completely out in the cold and the only other time he was used was for a goal against Hearts. That, that, that's, that's part of the, the things that don't make sense to me. There's, there's a lot that just doesn't make sense and I, and I think our, the games where we have been organised and have looked very good, two of them have been against Rangers and that's the reason why you're still top of the league. However, Simply the that. level of consistency in our record against the rest isn't as good as theirs. Consistency is the big word and it's a key word, isn't it? Because two really good performances against Rangers and that allows us to be in the position we're in but then some really sketchy stuff against Kamarnock twice, Hearts, we drew with Hibs, didn't we? We drew with St. Johnson, yeah, Mother um, some good stuff in Europe, a couple of kind of shakier moments as well. But to win league titles, Asim, you absolutely need to have that consistency, but you need to have that depth of squad to be able to bring that consistency. And the boys have mentioned various other things. We've now mentioned that your first choice backup striker was, was Rocco Vatt on Saturday, and he might well go into good things at Celtic, but that can't be a great position. 
No, and you've, you've touched on the games where we've actually been good, and I think it's probably a handful this season. Yeah. But maybe Aberdeen. five. A- Aberdeen, Hearts away, Atletico Madrid at home, and the two Rangers games. You look at those games, all quite big games. The ones where Rodgers likes to show up, you know, comes in with a swagger. Is that now is that now portraying itself with the players? They, they only seem to turn up in these big games now because that on Saturday had the hallmarks for us to really go out and have a good victory. You know, I felt like there was a feel good, like you, you said um, off air, Miff, that we were, you went into it buzzing for it. I was the same. I was looking forward to us getting back into league action, back to Celtic Park after the, the Bucky Thistle game. And I thought, you know, after a minute, right, we could really go on here and, and put out a statement of victory. But the fact that the, the 89 minutes preceding that were just so bad, you're like, why? Where's this come from? So it's twofold for me. The squad depth and quality in the squad is just not at it. Right? I think we've, we can all agree on that and we will probably touch on the wider, bigger picture after. But in isolation, I, I've been patient with the manager. I've kind of thought, you know what, it's, it's less on him and more on the, the, the tools he's been given. But the more you're watching, the more you're you're looking at it and you're like, he should be doing better. He should still be doing better. I, I can think of, in the second half, uh, a moment when we had the chance to break. I think it was O'Reilly. No, I know he was heavily compromised with his injury, but we, we literally walked out our own half. And the, the team walked as a unit out of their own half. And so that I would suggest that's probably an instruction. But if it's not an instruction, does that mean the players can't read the room for want of a better expression? That come yeah, on, lads, you know, are, are, were they happy that the fact that they were up and they? Could, I, I, I just, for me, it just seems a bit off. You need to remember we won the game, which was the most important thing, especially given the result at, uh, in Paisley earlier on. Sorry about that. Um, so, it's it's easy now in hindsight to say, right, okay, we've won the game. But now, how many days was that? A couple of days on. There's been nothing in terms of reaction to it around. You'd think we would have come out and said, right, let's go and get a couple of deals done, whatever. I just think, as a fan base, we're getting absolutely mugged off. What you've got is the, the radio silence. And I suppose, I'm not entirely sure what the club can come out and say when there's no action. But the challenge is, well, go and, go and take action and, and then have something to say. You'll have seen and heard some of the the outrageous what's up. Oh, but we the ground. Ah, <laughs> Yeah. Did dad phone you? My dad phone is laughing. He's like, What's this about Rogers going to ski? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Brilliant. Hashtag fresh mountain air. <laughs> I've actually not seen this. What's that? Oh, oh, it's it's mental, oh, oh, oh it with my so, so, there's, there's several of them doing the rounds. Again, it, it harks back to the COVID season. You know, Shane, Shane Duffy's up to all sorts. <laughs> it's just, it's outrageous. But it's the way of the world here, you know, particularly the, the way social media is now. If you don't have any news, people generally fill in the blanks. Now, I'm not saying that's right and we shouldn't go and create our own. WhatsApp mysteries, but it's just it, it comes generally out of frustration that the club are, are taking no action at this point in time. The Celtic WhatsApp mysteries, a new series. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but I've just thought I'm just thought it went for the COVID season, but we would need to edit it out. No, nah, so we'll move on. Right. Tell you what we'll do. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping before <laughs> we before we do kick on. If you're listening to this episode of the Celtic Exchange in podcast format on Apple or Spotify, then make sure you're following the show there meaning you won't miss any upcoming episodes. And while you're there, take a moment to leave a short five-star review if you're enjoying what we do. Alternatively, if you watch the show on YouTube, then simply like this episode and subscribe to the channel if you aren't already doing so. These small things will take just a few moments but make a big difference to what we do here at the Celtic Exchange. So what we're going to do this week um, is basically cover one big question and I'll I'll put it to you at the moment. So with growing unrest amongst the fan base for a variety of reasons, some of which we've already covered, do one of Peter Lowell... Mark Lowell or Brendan Rodgers have to go tell us to move forward. I'll come to you first for your initial response. Initial response is yes, because it's clearly not compatible. We we, we were assured when Rodgers was reappointed that those issues were gone. Actions speak louder than words in these instances and from what we see, it's the same old, same old. I, I don't think anybody can sit here and say that things are in a, a good place and it all points to one relationship being off. But then, at the same time, you know, if Desmond's got his finger in the pulse, he should know this and be dealing with it and he doesn't appear to be. So, it's on him. But just on that, I mean, Brendan Rodgers seems to be Dermot Desmond's guy, but so does Peter Lawwell. So, so what's required? And, you know, I asked the question to you earlier on, James, does he have to just come and get a hold of the two of them with the scruff of the neck and say you need to sort this out because the club are suffering. I mean, it's it's pathetic. I mean, Mark Lawl's sitting there. He might be very good at his job at a different level. We'll never know. 
because Celtic won't step to that level. He might be instructed from the board, Michael Nicholson, whoever it may be, his dad, saying, well, your budget is to go and find a 10 grand left back. So he goes and finds a 10 grand, grand left back a week, shows it to Rodgers, and Rodgers goes, you're not listening, I told you to get me quality, that's no quality, I've got that level already here, back you go. And it looks like Mark Law's not doing his job, but it's actually originating at the top, you know, the fish rots from the head down. It's there's no say that again. The fish it rots from the head down. <laughs> there's this guy, no this guy's there's no professional oversight at Celtic. First of all, professional oversight on your chairman so that he's not overreaching. Stay in your box, do your job, be an ambassador. That is it. But how can you have that when you've got a back channel from your head of recruitment? Because anything Roger says goes straight back to Peter Law via Mark Law. It just wouldn't be the real world if that wasn't the case. So for that reason, Mark Law just shouldn't be there. Or Peter Law just shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Both of them. Just a Both. small small point of the glass he's got to get brought into play at some point. Nothing he to stab you. He, he puts them on when he's angry, man. I know, no, I see they're there. They're ready. They're ready to come. <laughs> uh, see, just just on that that point though. See what James says is absolutely true. That the bit about the fish. But, but, uh, yeah, well, which is all that's factually <laughs> correct. True, eh? It's factually correct. That I, I, what you've described there is literally what I think is happening. Right, <laughs> and that is insane. That but we are in that position. Uh, p- for pathetic, 120 million pathetic turnover was business. the word that James used. What genuinely David Brent esque office squabbles going on inside yeah. Celtic Park over recruitment yeah. when we're a multi million pound turnover business? You know, it's just ridiculous. It's absolute, Jing absolute Rod- nonsense. Jing Rogers is going in and Mark Law's taking the last tea bag and all that. I, 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 I keep smoking, like, eating his sandwich and that when it's in the fridge. I, I, I just nonsense. Who's <laughs> to blue milk? That's absolute oh, nonsense. Got my name on it. Um, I, it, it t- to me, what was the point in bringing Rogers back? I, I just, that, that's the back. And why is back he came to? back? Why, why, is he, why, is he he I, why, why did they say yes? Yeah. He's obviously <laughs> been given assurances and have not been seen through. Yeah, 100%. Just, just to stay on track while we're covering Mark Law, well, or, you know, of the three individuals. Asim, do you feel he's in an impossible position? So he's got Brendan Rogers. A very headstrong guy, you know, a very kind of confident guy, a very experienced guy, demanding a certain type of player. Whereas he might have other pressures, I'm going to say professional pressures, but personal pressures. His dad, listen, they're, they're, they're father and son, right? There's, there's that trust, there's that relationship, and blood's thick on water. And if his dad's telling him one thing and, and steering him down a certain road, and Brendan Rogers, his colleague, is saying another thing, there's a real genuine conflict there. And I've got to say, and it probably won't go down too well, I kind of feel sorry for the guy because I don't think he's been able to carry out his job properly. I'm I don't think he's qualified for the job. That, that's yeah. very possible as well. He should never have been put in the position. Yeah, yeah but he's and been pulled in whole, various directions. This whole thing that was Andrew's man, I think we'll, oh, we'll find out very soon no. that was not the case. Oh, you know, no. he's, he's, he's as much Andrew's man as Andrew was Don McKay's man. Yeah. And that's the problem. There's no communication. There's no clarity. Uh, we're, we're fed lies, essentially. Um but the confusing thing for me is why Rogers has agreed to come back under these circumstances, or was he duped as well? Was he sold a dream? And it's just told because Mark Lowell's been in obviously how long now? It's his, his fourth transfer window. Yeah, and if you look, they've gradually got worse. So that makes you think. I, I, you know, you've said you feel sorry for him, but in any other Kinda. walker, like any other industry, he would not still be in this job. Why is he still in this job? You look at today, Gustav Lagerbiel because away, he's been in. Well, I think he's going going on loan. That was not a Rogers signing. So why did Rogers say he signed off on it? And were these signings, were there, was there even a discussion made between Lowell and, and the manager at the time? Because by all accounts, Rogers was pretty sure on it straight away that this, is not, this guy's not going to work. What you're going to have is a situation where Lager Bielka, Marco Tillio and Quan, who's already moved on, those three are more than likely going to end up at different clubs by the end of this January window. That's three of your summer signings. Have, have proven within four months they're not good enough and if that's not telling you the recruitment team aren't doing their job then what is and actually I've, I've got various notes here um, Mark Lowell I think is unsackable no matter how good or bad he does his job because who's going to sack him Who, who's well, the guy course. that's going to sack the chairman's son the chairman who has so much influence at Celtic I don't think you know Brendan Rodgers has got the capacity to sack him so who else is some exec going to come up and say Peter your boy's not doing it so he's off it's just not going to happen whereas Nick Hammond didn't succeed at Celtic. Lee Conger didn't succeed, you know, in terms of recruitment. And they move on right. and that's how it goes. Yeah. I think the only way Mark Lawwell moves on is Get if he this. himself decides or if his dad says to him, this isn't going to work out or if Dermot Desmond pulls him or the two Lawwells aside and says, it's not working out, Mark, let's get you back into the city group. I just think he can be, and we don't really know how good or bad he is at his job, but we think it's not great. 
But I just think he's in a position where we can't move him on in the way that you should be able to at a multi-million pound business. Of course, but you know, the, the part of the, the, the boon and the atmosphere on, on, on Saturday is we've been here before with dynasties, with the Kellys and the Whites, and what you're describing there is exactly what was going on way back then. It's, we've got a problem here, we've got an ex exec who's not performing, ah, but that's John's pal or whatever it may be. So it just stays and we just keep you know, suffering mediocrity on and on. So that's exactly what we've got just now. The, the nepotism at Celtic is just ridiculous. I mean, I, I really think we're, we're in a situation where new ownership needs to be, you know, on the cards, but I, I don't see Desmond looking to sell. No, and, and that takes you in a very separate question of better the devil you know. Do you stick with Dermot Desmond knowing that this is how he operates or do you risk getting bought over by a Saudi consortium you or something bought over like by that? Tony Bloom or someone like that, a progressive forward-thinking you know, conglomerate? He's a bright the guy, The thing with Peter Lowell as well is, well is his, his very presence has led to kind of toxicity. Just him being back yeah. has led to this. So as soon as things start going a bit, you know, it's, all right, you, everyone's going to start and that's what's happened. It's led to toxicity for us, the fans, but it's led to reassurance for Lowell's loyalists within Celtic and there are Lord hundreds Stoke, of them that's the problem. You know, they make up the mainstay because they've all been employed there whilst Lowell's been in charge and that's why Celtic we talked about it on, on the post-match no fresh thinking Don Mackay for all his you know yeah. whatever he wanted fresh thinking he wanted the best in class at every level and all the Celtic departments went it's probably bad for me because I'm not the best in class here so let's Ro complain Robert about Roy. it and get him binned Man yeah. mandatory chinos and boat shoes yeah. then he could do yeah. no on, um, <laughs> on the question then of Peter Lowell how much does Celtic need Need Peter Lowell as chairman? Was he the was he the only show in town, or could we just have got a you know any other name? A, 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 almost anybody else, bar Peter Lowell. This might have been a very different conversation. And I know he sits on the ECA, which is the European Club Association board. But I'm just wondering how much. Yes, that's generally speaking got to be a positive. But does it outweigh all the negative that comes with Peter Lowell returning to Celtic? And I'm not sure. I, We've no idea really across the whole fan base, but it certainly feels like the vast, vast majority of the fan base just are not happy with him being back in place. The, the pattern of behaviour at the club tells you everything you need to know. Look at when he wasn't there to when he's come back. The, the, the same familiar patterns happening again. And I know people may listen to this and go, oh, he's talking about that again. But it's the one thing that's wrong with the club just now is the dynamic between Lawwell, Rogers, the board, and the impact it's having in the playing squad. So when that starts to happen, it's always going to be a topic of conversation for us. I think the problem for us, sitting here and, and the wider support who care about it, is everybody feels like they're banging their head against a brick wall because we're probably going to walk into a situation again here where, like you say, Lawwell, our father and son, Unless they choose to go, they're not going to be removed. So, what does it, where does that leave us? The most likely thing is, it's the manager that walks. And we'll get to that after <laughs> just a short break. Welcome back, folks. We've been discussing the, the ongoing question about Mark Lowell, Peter Lowell and Brendan Rodgers. And I want to focus a wee bit more at the moment on the manager. If you said just before the break there, you know, if push comes to shove and the Lowells himself decide not to move on as seems to be their gift, something's got to give and it would be Brendan Rodgers. I would certainly ask the question that, almost regardless of asking what Brendan Rodgers achieves this season and potentially beyond, there's a certain element of the fan base <laughs> who just won't be happy until he's removed. Do you feel like that's the case? Um, Not just about math, but... I think he, there's a certain fan base that will take longer to warm to him and then the first sign of him not doing so great will probably be quicker to pounce on that. Um, if he was, if he proves to be successful, I think everyone will get on board. But we we I don't know. We spoke earlier about his comments after the game, and I I personally didn't think that was the right tone to go down after a, a performance and and just the, the the way everyone's feeling at the moment. I don't think it was the right comment to make. Um, the one about when when asked about the booing, he said it's not the result, it's me, or if it's not if it's not me, it's the board. Um, I don't know what what does he even mean by that. You know, is, what's what's he suggesting that the fans are just never happy. Is that really the kind of thing you should be saying after, again, a performance like that? Uh, I don't know. You wonder if this is, he's starting to sound the way he did towards the end of his first tenure, I feel, where he was just starting saying things and it, you were, you were kind of trying to read between the lines. I don't know if, if, if he's unhappy and he's kind of now realising that uh, this is not what I signed up for. 
Uh, it could be something along those lines. But I, I think if he was to come in, if he, if he doesn't win the league, I think he's gone. Obviously, I think he'll 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 go himself or mutual consent, something like that. Think it, so. Aye, hundred percent. He's not Thanks staying so. if we don't win. <laughs> if he lasts that long, uh, if we don't win the league, yeah. he's not staying. Yeah. He's he's gone. Yeah, he mugged, will be empty. That, that to use his own phrase. You'll be mugging us off if they really mugged him off. Yeah. Asa mentions a quote, and I'm going to read it out. So he was asked about the booze at full time against Ross County, and he said, "I've had that since I've been here. If it's not the result, it's me. If it's not me, it's the board. So all we can do as a team is win games and try to improve and develop, and that's what the team have done. The team and ourselves, the staff, we work very hard every day." So we're very much together and that's how we'll continue to be. I've got to be honest with you, I thought some of the, the noise about that quote, and it was on a Saturday night on Twitter, which is a hell of a place, but I <laughs> thought there was a bit of mischief making going on. I actually don't think there's a whole lot wrong with what he said, but some people have very much engineered that into a Rogers attacks the fans type thing. Keith Jackson has put, put his article out this morning. Tells you you need to know. And that he's made a, a full article about it, so... I'm not in any way comparing you to Keith Jackson, Asim, <laughs> but I do think Brent. I, I, I've said for a long time that Brendan Rodgers does not have the goodwill and the leeway that a new manager would have. He's come back with baggage, you know, and we can all accept that. And the moment small things are going wrong in Brendan Rodgers' world, they're being amplified. And I think, I think even if Celtic do go on to win the league this season, which which I firmly believe we will. He'll get a bit of leeway for a few weeks and then we'll get into next season and the first game he drops points in or the first time we drop points in Europe or something will be, ah, it's not working out, he's not the man. You know, he's just getting such a, he's got such a short thread, James. And and listen, maybe that's just the way it is and maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but there's there's just not enough, or not a lot of patience and goodwill towards Brendan Rodgers from certain elements. Yeah, but this is, this is controlled by Celtic, by the board, by the budget team, by the recruitment team. This is where, you know, He's agreed to come in and he's talking about quality and strength and, you know, all these kind of things. He needs more in the team, more of that in the team. I'm sitting there like an absolute mug in the summer going, we're going to break our spending record. <laughs> Twice, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, an absolute idiot. And, 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 the I, I, did, I sat here and I said, the one thing <laughs> that Celtic don't do is put the foot down when they're on top. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm, trying to get away a bit. You know, it's, it's just what they do and it's an absolute joke. So we've not gone and done that, right? What we've told them we're going to do so things are tight and performances aren't as they were, which has got the fans on his back, you know, the ones that aren't buying into it. You know, I was really quite disgusted the way Rodgers left and all that kind of stuff. And I I knew it was a bit of both. It was a bit of law, it was a bit of Rodgers. But I, I thought, you know, I really thought, you know, he's played a, a big part in leaving, especially when he left and all that stuff. And then you see this season, you go, it's not him that's doing it again. It's Celtic yeah. that are doing it to him again. That and this is this has shown me really... The first time, I'm starting to have less and less blame on, on Rodgers at all. I agree. It's low. Because towards the end of Rodgers' tenure, a lot of people would say, ah, he was working his ticket since the start of that third season. You can't be seriously suggesting now that, you know, six, seven months back, he's already working his ticket again. It's clear there's something else at play. And I agree. And people can shoot me down as they often do. But I I'm in the Rodgers camp. I think he's a talented coach. I think Celtic are lucky to have him. But he has made mistakes and I'll, and I'll certainly accept that. But I do feel the biggest issue here is that the club are letting him down again. Well, I've seen the summer, the COVID summer of spending money on Ajete and Barkas being used as oh, a stick to, to beat us with around, well, that's why we shouldn't do it. We chose Ajete over Ivan Tony, who was sitting in the building. <laughs> Who's worth 30 million now. So oh, easy. So, yeah. easy. you know, don't give me that yeah. absolute nonsense. We chose to haggle over 250 grand to St John McGinn. It's the choices that we make that are the problem. We, as, as a matter of course, for a club of our size with the resources we have, we should be buying five, six million players all the time. Yeah. Never mind. And selling them for 15, so, 20, so selectively that we can pick out the ones that we have and grade them as good or bad. We should just be going back and doing it again and again and again. And the fact that we don't is what the most frustrating thing is. We have the resources to do that. The, the Rodgers blame game, uh, what Rodgers did was wrong, but you're right, this time round, it's on the board, it's all on the board, because he has not been back. Someone tweeted today, I can't remember who it was or if you guys seen it, but they basically listed the time Celtic have gone and spent big, and it's guys like Odds and Edward. And Panic. No, no, the, the ones no, I've no. worked out. No, when we spend big, it's when we're panicking. Well, you, you could certainly debate that, but generally speaking, it's worked out. You know, you've got Edward, you've got uh, 
Carter Vickers, Jota. Carter Vickers, Julian. Jota. You can go right back into history and look at Neil Lennon, Chris Sutton, uh, John Hartson. You know, th- these times for Celtic have gone a wee bit a- away from the strategy yep. and they've, they've speculated to accumulate. And generally it's worked out. There are some failures. You've mentioned two of the biggest ones, Zermuff, but that certainly cannot be a reason not to do it again. And it's you made the call, Muff, a couple of weeks ago when we signed Nicholas Kuhn. He's such a Celtic type of signing. He might go on to be great. Yeah. Who knows? Good luck to him. But he falls within the two or three million pound bracket, has some potential, hasn't really kicked on, and we'll take the gamble on him as And it's just, again, I think this malaise, this feeling we all have at this moment in time is because we've seen this movie way too many times before and it feels like it's happening again. It's the 50-50 punts. They might go on and be all right. And what we tend to do is we'll buy about four of them uh-huh. at that price range. So you look at Jota's left for 25 million. We bought in Tilio, Yang, uh, Kuhn and is there another one? Another Palma, Palma. Palma four wingers right in the hope that one of them turns out good or you know that it's just a gamble same with the midfield Bernardo, Holm uh, Quan. we're bringing in so many and just hoping it's just a, it's a punt rather than look quite, like you said the majority of those guys you listed earlier where we've maybe spent a bit over and above what we normally do majority of them have been successes Edward the, the difference is obviously what we did with those was the loan to buy so again it's just a symbolic of how Cautious the club are You risk, know it's always risk averse. risk averse It's always reactive Rather than proactive It's always like you say Let's make sure first So It's no surprise then That you've got these guys Nine nine of them came in the summer I said a few weeks ago Palma was the only one Week by week I'm thinking He's not even He's not even You know he's too inconsistent I know you You're kind of more He's my new Mikey Johnson <laughs> But Because <laughs> Mikey's, he Mikey's got to go <laughs> You know Whether it's his attitude Whether it's his Consistency His output I just I don't know about him either But again You, you give these guys time but we've we've lost so many good, important, experienced players in the last couple of windows, and we've just not gone and replaced them with like sure things. And I know in football you can never be sure, as you mentioned with Barkas and Ayeti, but you give yourself the best opportunity, and we don't. We're constantly trying to do it on the cheap, uh, reactive. We've got so much money in the bank, yet still. I think for the board, for them, it's clear. As long as we're a wee bit better than the Rangers and participating in European competition, that's the level of their ambition, and it doesn't match where we as fans think the club could be at. Yeah, and it's hard to see beyond that being the, the ambition of the board. Um, the £70 million in the bank thing, again, we were speaking, James, what should be a really positive thing to come out with and say, look how well we are operating as a club, we've got £70 million in the bank, it's actually became a, an issue. It's become a negative and it's a stick to beat the, the board with because it's it's the £70 million that you're not spending and everyone's... Sorry, was, was it no Chris Duffy on the day that announced he was like, ah, but there's tax to pay on that? And you're like, to try and put the brakes on it. I to try and like, you know, take the sting out of Chris how McKay. much. Chris McKay, I thought it was Crystal, maybe, maybe Chris McKay. And we've got to spend money in Barrafield. You know, saying we're not saying go and spend all seventy, but definitely go and spend twenty to thirty of it on quality. Sorry, Muff. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. No, well, that, that's that's it. Very few football clubs will run with that sort of cash reserve. So it, it's it's what's the word? It's kind of negligent to run with that. It's not the, the right approach from a business point of view. Because you need to continually reinvest. You need to reinvest in the playing squad. So I listen, for me this issue needs addressed decisively because what we can't have is trundling towards the end of the window. That there is one thing about the transfer window and one thing that is very lobby. He likes to be the last one to sign somebody out of Celtic and Rangers. He's always liked that, having the last sign. He's, al- he's always liked that. If you go back to the, the transfer windows, he loves he loves that. What an approach. Take them off the back pages. But I thought... It, I, well, Jeez, oh man. But I, thought we were, I really thought we were by that. When Andrew was in, you know, we knew three players, I think, that were coming in. Um, Adeguchi, Maeda, Hitati. Riley. Um, Four. And then, well, McGree juked us and then Riley came in. So that showed what we thought was a change in tact and identification behind the scenes, early doors, what we needed, getting deals done, players signed, all that type of thing. That seems to have just kind of dripped away to the point where who have we been linked with? Sidney Van Hoydonk, Owen Beck, Mayowski, Chris Garden. Mayo- Mayowski, Chris Garden. You know, it, it, but there's, there's nothing. There's nothing. And is it a case of what we're going to get? Now, bear in mind, Asia Cup, we knew was coming We've not signed them to cover him to yet And we've played Two games Remember the Can line Can you imagine Kyogo We've, we've got played, we've up played, for we've played two know. games We've not signed them to. Brendan Rodgers said about six weeks ago But there's a plan for that yeah. What was the plan? 
So wait and see. I, I, I hate to quote him, but I've got to go radio in the way in, and I'm the, the football almanac that is Mark Guidi said it's one of two things. He said they, you know, they, they didn't have a plan or they had a plan and went, Kyogo's not going, abandon the plan. Uh, yes, you know, just but that's most likely. It. Yeah, that, that is most likely. And same with Taylor not, now. Taylor's got injured, so suddenly you'll probably see an emergency left back coming just because he's injured. Or Rocco Vatastain. Yeah. Aye. Just like a new signing. I know. There's so much going on. Um, let's just take it back just to, to Brendan Rodgers and, and perceptions of him and how well he's doing or not at this moment in time. And I'll ask the question, you know, I've, I've obviously talked about the fact that he's got less goodwill, less leeway than, than other managers. What if it was Enzo Maresca or somebody of that out who had taken the job in summer? And he'd beaten Rangers successfully, home and away. He'd put in some really good performances in Europe, albeit it hadn't got the wins that we thought, but, you know, brilliant draw at Atletico Madrid and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he's got you five points clear at the turn of the year. Are you pretty happy if Enzo Maresca does that? Yeah, I think I think he would have slightly more goodwill for a lot of the fan base. Is that just um, what it comes down to, though? Is it just the but, Brendan Rodgers factor? No, not, not necessarily. I think as well, though, that regardless of who was manager at this point, at this point, from where we are now, especially when you've had what I would say was a fairly turgid and tired performance for the team, relying on the same players all the time, all the time, all the time, with no plan in place for instances when you were going to happen, it's inevitable Taylor's got to pick up an injury just surely, with, sh- Volume purely games, because yeah. of how often he plays and the sheer amount of ground that he covers when he does play. Um. The striker situation when you always going to be and potentially Kyogo was going to go away when Hatati as well we've not had him most of the season but you know there's just so much of that that when you was coming the noise might even have been louder because that would have been a new manager not being supported in hindsight you could look at what's been achieved so far and say Rogers has actually done a really good job to achieve what he has with working against him yeah because he's not had Hatati and Vickers available all season. And Maeda, big spells. And, and effectively, the players purchased for him have been deemed not good enough to be in the squad. Mm-hmm. So, you could argue it's good management for him to do what he's done. That's exactly so what I am. I think it is good management, but I think that... Position based on shoot. Yeah, that, that success that he's had, and I think he's been successful this season so far based on the resources he's had available, but I think that's getting drowned out by the, the bigger picture. Let me ask a specific question about Brendan Rodgers. Please do. When he was appointed... He himself was asked about the, the three-year deal. Will you be here for the three years? He said, unless I'm emptied, quote-unquote, I'll be here. Um, do you think, for whatever reason, he'll see out the three years? I'll come to you first, ask him. No. Not if Mark Lowell does. Sorry? Not if Mark Lowell does. What does that mean? If Mark Lowell stays, Rogers goes. Right. That's my yeah. sentiments exactly. I'd like him to be here, I'd like him to be successful, but I, I just I, cannot see I him staying here. for the yeah. full three years. It just doesn't feel like it's going to go that way. Something's got to give. You you don't make him your highest paid manager ever and then back him with what we've given him. I no. think if he was given the, the, the right tools and the the backing that we feel that he, he deserves, he's a good, good manager. Um, but I think, as you've... I was kind of where you're at, Miff, in terms of you could almost argue he's done well to get us where we're at. But then at the same time, you look at how many times have you enjoyed watching Celtic this season? And that that's keeps sticking with me as well. Like, I'm think, not enjoying the football at all. I think that's part of it. Just, Rogers has got a squad that he doesn't it, want. He's got do players I mean? that don't fit his yeah, size. So he's going, I, I can I can try and you know, work this, but it's square peg round hole stuff. So is he and in that, a difficult position impact, then? Where he, he can't really come out and call it out? But well, you can't because then your players will down tools, you know? So it's, it's, it's impossible. I think what's potentially most fascinating about everything going on just now is what we hear from Brendan Rodgers say on Friday window yeah. closed press <laughs> conference ahead of the Aberdeen Probably game on Saturday way. and at that point we'll all know the lie of the land good, bad or indifferent and I think you'll see some uh, very interesting comments for Brendan Rodgers you think you'll be point. there? Can I, <laughs> can I make a prediction? Back on the ski slopes I'll make a prediction Two loan signings Yes Yeah I think so I think definitely one I think a left back will come in Two loan yeah. signings You think a striker as well? Potentially yes what if it's no loan signings, no any signings? Can you imagine we go through this window? I can't see that. There was so much focus on the fact that we knew what we had to do going into the window and we get we come out it with I, Nicholas Kuhn and nobody else. I genuinely think you'll see, you know, a, a reduced attendance in match day is, mm. is what I, I fear. I'll still be there, but oh, look at we you. know, we know, <laughs> faith faith through. I keep we know faith. I'll be there to hurl my abuse. <laughs> Not Staunch. A, I. I, th- this is what happens. The f- it turns into apathy. Mm. It, d- it doesn't matter if you're if you're 
you know, you're, you're winning titles. There's a, a level of expectation for the fans to right what's going to come next. We we expect almost to win the league, rightly or wrongly. We yeah. we are entitled to expect to win the league. But entertainment. But it's about being entertained, but also being excited by going to Celtic Park by seeing new signings, by seeing what's coming up next, by hopefully entering the new Champions League format. You know all those things that that come with it. And just now it feels like it's almost like we've got to this point and the board are saying, why can't you not just be happy with this? Mm-hmm. And we're saying, well, we are happy, with it, but we want to kick on again. And we think the manager wants to kick on again. And we're sure that the senior players in the squad want to kick on. Now, one thing we've not mentioned is excellent work in getting Vickers to sign a new deal. There's a lot of players in the squad, e- excellent mainstay players that have had, you know, you need to give the board credit in that because Matt, but it goes back to the madness of the situation. Would they have done that if they were told, right, we can't sign them, the lads, we're just got to sign all using long term contracts. They would all have went, well, no, you're all right, I'll just leave. So, are they being promised that something's going to happen? It, it just it doesn't make any sense to me. Please, somebody come out and make sense of this. Well, what do you make of the timing of that? You look at it last week, I just thought that was a whole PR mission with firstly, you've got Matt O'Reilly's bid. And then suddenly we're, we've rejected that, you know, and it's it's coming out as like, okay, we've rejected a big bid for our best player. So let's try to, you know, give a feel good to the news. And then CCV, you can announce his uh, contract anytime. You could do it on Friday. Yeah. I, I think it's very much a, there's not a lot going on here. So I've spoken about the radio silence coming from Celtic Park and they've chosen to fill the gap with. But as well. We could do the CCV stuff just now. I throw that in, that'll keep them happy. And it's just, it's, it's nowhere near it enough. It shows you how out of touch they are. You know, of course we're delighted Vickers is, is signed a long-term deal, but how out of touch are they that they think that's going to I, I, I actually the feel it's quite poor on Carter Vickers because everyone's saying, ah, that's great news, but yeah, you know, it's Carter it's Vickers isn't getting his place there. He's not getting the, yeah. the adulation he deserves for committing yeah. to the club. If that had happened in the summer, I think the, the early stuff under Rodgers' tenure this time was getting, you know, Mack and all that. Cal Mack and Kyogo, yeah, 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 all that stuff, and Riley. And if you'd got it in then, yeah, they got the same reaction but yeah it's been isolated in a, in a we need some good news here we've used Carter Vickers as a PR pawn myth and that uh-huh. is unacceptable tell you what just to stay on track to to reiterate the original question and get your final answers on it so with the growing un- unrest amongst the fans do one of Pierre Lowell Mark Lowell or Brendan Rodgers have to move on to let us move forward and if so who uh, yes and and I hope it's the, the Lowells because We've shown that we can be an efficient, well-run, modern, progressive club when they're not there. James, that's that's probably one way to do it. And probably my preferred way to do it, but you know, the certainly work that doesn't. So it's first and foremost oversight for Peter Law. You're a chairman, stay in your box. <sighs> Actually, let's see. Can Matt Law do the job at the right budget? So increase the budget. It's not going to happen, is it? And Rogers, I would keep as a talented manager, but you need to back him. So I think in the end. It's going to be Mark Law that gets a hit. Mm. Awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. If none of the three move on, can you see? I'm us... moving on. If none, going <laughs> <laughs> to support Queens Park. Uh, can you see us making north. progress? Can you can you see us getting out of this this malaise, this negative feeling around the club, or does somebody have to go? And I don't like. Listen, I'm not calling for people to lose their jobs. It's not quite that, but something needs to change. Yeah, there's a strategy needs to change then completely, but we just, we, we've been around the block far too long. We know that's not going to happen. Are we suddenly going to become an ambitious, progressive club that speculate to accumulate, that want to take the club to the next level? And for me, the next level is, yes, domestic and dominance, which we all like, but I see this all entitled to, um, argument that you, you see. It's ambition. Yeah, it's ambition. It's, you know, we're in a league where there's only one or two teams that are going to win it. Um, we are, we're, we should be miles ahead of them. You know, we were comfortably ahead of them two or three months ago. But again, just due to lack of ambition, lack of forward planning. Like, you look at us after that Rangers game in at the new year, we were all we we're all delighted. You know, that was a great win. We suddenly picked up a bit of form. There was a feel good around, um, around the place. Go and use the January window to really amplify that. And we've just done the opposite. You know, we've, we've like, on the back of six wins in a row, you'd think we'd be in a much better place in terms of the fan base but we're not and that's again just because of the, the typical standpoint where where the club they treat it as a business first and foremost and a f- football club second and if that continues then no I don't think we're going to progress much because you, you've just not got the tools for it I will say one thing though and it's to matters on the pitch that I have now have a growing belief that quite simply when Dyson doesn't play we don't play now I know I know, I know what you're thinking in terms of how he can be on the ball sometimes 
But I just think it's, I don't know, just his, his work ethic and the effect that he has in the team is just a lot more than maybe we, we give him credit for. So is Palma out on the bench? Because you just signed a guy, so he's going to play. Is Palma out and dies in in? Hold on the two, he's, he's gone way off topic. <laughs> it's not in the chat. <laughs> Need to stay focused. But I, you were told yes, to stay yes. on the agenda to pa- start pa- the show. Pa- 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 Palma's in the bench for me, yes. Yeah, and conclude the law wills need to go, and I think Muff needs to go. <laughs> well, yes. I just think something's no not quite working out. But you know, as they say, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And I think that's where we find ourselves with Celtic, whether it's personnel or strategy or whatever it might be, budgets, something needs to change. And just one final is. one, like say we win the league, which you know I, I think we're all probably think or hopeful, but as, I think it's 50 50 now, right? But you you try and be on the hopeful side that we we will be able to see it through. Partly because I do still have belief in the manager that he's he's a better manager than they've got, and you know he's he's been there before and he's he's seen us through. But if we win the league, we'll have the same issues in summer. We'll all be buzzing for this new Champions League. We're great. Are we going to finally break our break the bank and get some? And it'll be just the same old story. So, well, <laughs> so at some point you go, it's us, yeah. isn't it? You're, you're, you're the problem. We're the you're, not, you're not changing. It's me. Needs to change. Big summer signing. Welcome back, Marion Schwed. So somebody mentioned John Joe Kennedy. Oh ah, my goodness. Ah. Yeah, yes, but something, I as I say, something needs to change and let's see what that turns out to be. Let's take a short break and when we return, Assam will be giving us this week's Mystery Celt. Welcome back, folks. We're now going to turn to this week's Mystery Celt, which is brought to us by Assam. But before we do so, we'll take a quick look at last week's, which was provided by Joe. Uh, so the clues there. Number one, I was capped twice for my country, both qualifying matches. Number two, I've played in France, Tunisia, Spain, Portugal, Japan and Scotland. One of these nations are represented at international level. And number three, I was signed by Neil Lennon in 2012 and scored three goals for Celtic. He had his all stumped and, and rightly so. This is a guy that is instantly forgettable with all due respect. The answer was Lassad, uh, the Tunisian international. A few boys in the comments. Go to them. Uh, it's, it's Wikipedia, Google, all that stuff. <laughs> Surely. <laughs> Especially. I have no idea. But listen, he was uh, signed in 2012, as Joe mentioned, September 2012, on a free transfer after being been released by Deportiva La Coruña. He was released within 12 months of that. He moved on in August 2013 after 19 appearances. 19? How did I miss them? I, I, played against Barcelona, didn't m- No, that was Miku. Majority, majority, majority would have been off the bench. I'd, I'd have guessed he'd have had a half dozen appearances so 19 appearances and three goals that Joe mentioned so very briefly my friend, I think it has to be brief <laughs> your thoughts and comments on Lassad <laughs> I, 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 again I didn't think he was the he was the worst I've, I've ever seen but yeah, highly forgettable that's <laughs> damning with faint praise isn't it Cause, cause he's got a decent goal against hearts did not he I've seen Mo Bangura so. I even remember uh, his goals yeah uh. um I hope he doesn't last. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but instantly forgettable this sad. Yeah, be better at football. Yeah. Did we sign him and Miku in the same window? Uh, I, I think, think so. so. Yeah, I think yeah. they two landed at the same yeah. time. So well done to Joe, but also a bit sneaky by Joe throwing in a Lassad there. That's a bit Me, but breaking the rules. Uh, <laughs> Asim, I hope you right. get something better for us. I've had a glance at yours, so. so I think this is a better one for the boys. Is so let's a, hear the... Is the, there a minimum appearances level we need to set? There should the be. Threshold. Yeah, 19 you know? is the minimum uh, appearances. Tw- 20 is the minimum. Go for right. it, Asim. Three clues. First clue, Martin O'Neill signed me from another Scottish club and I went on to win two league titles in my time at Celtic. Not yet. Okay, second clue. Yeah? Yep, go for it. I played 56 times and scored 22 times for my country, a country that's still involved in the current African Cup of Nations. Any guesses? Clue number three. The other two Scottish clubs I played for are St Johnston and Kilmarnock. Do you agree, Muff? Yep. I don't guess two. Yeah, got it. So we'll get that beeped out Good for one. those at home, yeah. but it's a decent one and I think it qualifies, so it's, yes. it's a, a bit more yeah. gettable I, I, than Joe's. And I really like them. I didn't realise he scored that many goals for a really guinea. Like- Oh, but he really played more as a versatile player for us, wasn't he? He was. Ah. He was a bit. He, I think he suffered. Like, and I, I don't win. want to give too much away here for anyone still trying to guess, it? but I do think he suffered from the fact that he didn't have a set position. No. He was sometimes at right back, sometimes around the midfield, sometimes oh, even higher up. I really liked him. Yeah. I really liked him. We'll discuss all his highlights in next week's show. Remember, if you want to set the mystery cell for a future episode, just get in touch via Twitter, and you could be the one providing the clues next time around. Um, as we head into the final section of the show today, I want to just have a kind of general roundup of the, the state of play in terms of the, the transfer situation. Uh, obviously, at the time of recording here, we're Monday night, and unless anything dramatic's happened, it's it's as you were. We covered the, the Carter Vickers um, deal, so it's, it's worth kind of spending a wee bit of time on it. A five and a half year deal for him, that means he's here till 2029. 
There's a reported new four-year deal that's been offered to Rocco Vata, which is interesting given what's going on. And obviously, just after we recorded last week, it was confirmed that Celtic had knocked back an offer from Atletico Madrid for Matt O'Reilly. So, ask him your general take on, on those bits and bobs at the moment. Yeah, Carter Vickers, obviously, that's, that's big news. Um, he's he's still, for me, by far and away, our best centre-back. Um, I know there's question marks over his kind of fitness and injury problems this season, but I still think he's, you know, to have him tied down, that's brilliant news. And like I said, any other time, we'd be all delighted with that, but it's kind of been caveated in the last week or so just because of the lack of uh, incomings. Um, Matt O'Reilly, it was essential that we kept him. I don't think, you know, it was up for debate. You, you cannot sell your best player at this stage in the season. Um, and by all accounts, obviously, he's happy to kind of carry on. I think summer will be a different story. Um, and the Rocco Vata one's interesting because I feel like it's been such a, a U-turn in terms of suddenly we're, we're looking to extend his contracts. Um, Roger's comments suddenly changed as well last week where he was, you know, talking about developing young players. And again, it just sounded like it was all gearing up for, right, there's no many coming in. So this is this is what we'll do and we'll, you know, put out the stories next week. Yeah, the, the VATA situation is one of what I think is a number of confusing situations at the club. And you're right, the, the, the tone and the narrative changed very quickly and it almost to coincide with his return to the squad Roger speaks about youth. It's 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 almost staged PR, isn't it? You know, it's it's very little of what Celtic say, in particular Brendan Rogers say, is off the cuff. There's always a, a meaning behind the message, and I don't know what the future holds for Rocco Vata, but it's. Um, did you see his dad's interview? I did. I thought that was very interesting yeah. um, because the the suggestion was that his dad was maybe nudging him for a move, but he's that, actually his dad has said this is a, the best place for him to develop. They've put their hat around and they've not found the deal that they wanted and they went, hmm, actually the best deal is at Celtic then now, let's stay and see if we can get up the, the ratchet a wee bit. I, that's I think, what's happened. I think the lad himself seems to rate himself higher than yes. those around him. That that seems to be the chat. He's clearly got talent. You can't be where you are without talent. And you said that, if, if you make it at any level at Celtic, you know, and you end up on the fringes of the first team, you've got something about you, but you then need to develop and harness that talent. You can't just say, well, I've trained with the first team now, I've made my debut, so off to Serie A we go. I think, I'd like to see what happens. I'd like to see if Celtic can bring through another genuine talent. You know, half a dozen appearances in the first team isn't a, what I would call an academy graduate. An academy graduate is Callum McGregor, Kieran Tierney, James Forrest, you know, and others like that. It's not these guys that play two or three times and then they move on. So I'd really like to see what we can get from Rocco Vatt and, and if he's got the talent to become a genuine first team player at Celtic. I want to spend a wee bit of time though on... Just some of the, the talk doing the rounds. There's not a lot of rumours, Miff, as you've said. So Sidney Van Houdonk seems to be the big chap. Obviously, we all know who his dad is. He's 23 years of age. He's only made 11 appearances for Bologna this season. He's clearly not, you know, fancied too much there. Their manager is uh, Thiago Mota, who I think Rab Douglas knocked out for yeah, Barcelona. <laughs> um, oh, he Bobo. did. Bobo, so, Bobo knocked him out and Rab gets sent off. Hi, Rab. Was that it? Yeah. Um, just going back to Sidney Van Hoedonk though so he spent last season or part of last season on loan at Herenveen back in Holland and he scored 16 goals so he knows where the net is as a striker um, would you be pleased if a player of that out comes in I think he's 6'2 big powerful target man maybe the opposite type of striker from Kyogo and maybe something we need if, how does he compare to Jack Amakis and I know it's a well trodden path but you know he's miles away from that level I think getting him in on a short term loan deal is a bit of cover yeah, that's something, but he's he's not moving the needle. He's he's not going to he's he's not going to nudge Kyogo by any stretch or give Kyogo a rest even and say there's there's a guy we can rely on. It's not that. So you're not improving things. You're doing what you've been doing for the last four transfer windows stuff in the squad. Yeah, you're adding adding squad players potentially. What do you think, Muff? Does it does it excite you? I'm intrigued by it, but I wouldn't say I'm excited by it. The the style of play starves Kyogo of service, so. Would would Sidney Van Hooydonk's appearance make his play differently? I I, I don't know. Um, if anything, it would make it even more stark that we don't deliver the ball into the box quickly because he, he's a big physical striker. So, um, it's quite an intriguing one for me. I would I would like to think that it's the type of striker that we that we need. Um, I think any support and any sort of cover is welcome for Kyogo because we're only we're only a an eagle away from, from being in real trouble. So for, for me it would be it would definitely be a welcome signing of, of, of any type, whether it was loan, permanent, I think I think I think we just we need we need a striker in. Yeah. Definitely. This is where we've left ourselves. That's what they do to us, though, you don't know? they? You, you leave it so late that it's almost you'll out take, of desperation. You'll take, anything. You'll take yeah. anything. I don't yeah. think he's in that bracket of like 
you know, he's all, he, you know, his last last chance. Like, I, I'm comparing him maybe to Miofsky in terms of if, who would I prefer? Someone that we know can score domestically, and and previously I've kind of been against Miofsky, Shanklin, chat as well. Out of the two, I've always thought Miofsky, but how he's got 16 goals in the Dutch leagues is is decent. Mm-hmm. Um, what age did he say he was? 20, 23. 23, so again, a good age, but it's the usual kind of signing that we're doing, isn't it? Like, he might work out. It's not a 26, 27-year-old that's banging in goals consistently at a decent level that you just know is going to come in and hit the ground running. S- somebody commented in, in one of our posts or videos recently saying Celtic need to go and sign you know, a couple of guys between 27 and 30 years of age, and I had a think about it and I thought, we don't do that. We don't, we don't sign anybody that When did you last sign a guy who was at that age and stage in his career? Well, Kyogo was 27. And right. So it's Kyogo. <laughs> <laughs> Your number one striker. But uh, that's the only uh, one in it. And, and no, it's, worked he's an outlier. And it's, and it's not yeah, someone uh, that you're worried is going to leave. Straight. Straight. I know, but we, yeah. need, we need two or three of those. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you signed yeah, yeah. Kyogo. Yeah. It's, it's certainly worked and then some. He gets you Champions League money. Yeah. So, you you know, Celtic have just, they've forever get this whole thing about, I, I'm sure someday somewhere in the room, whenever they present a target, they go, 27. What's the resale like? What's the resale potential? That must be a big, big factor for Celtic. Rather than just say, who's the guy that can come in here and do the business for two seasons and we'll worry about resale later on? See if you went 80 20 on that, that probably works. So 20%, 20% of your guys are experienced yeah. and over 27, and the rest are, you know, we've done really well from yeah. 21 to 26 the last, you know, two, three years. It's just the balance needs to be there, and that's, what's, that's what that, wasn't that's, there in the summer. That, 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 that the balance up. is that money first, everything yeah. else second. There is such a lack of balance within our, our signing policy. So, yeah, there's other names potentially doing the rounds. Majowski that we've, we've seen, he scored a great goal in the weekend, which was very harshly called off. Don't know if you've seen it. Really nice finish against Hearts. So did Shankland. He did. A yeah. Clever strike. Um, there's another name doing the rounds Alex Palmer, 27 year old West Brom keeper. keeper. I don't know how two and a half million or something. that. Um, but there's nothing inspiring doing the rounds One other link that I've heard a few times Was a uh, Tommy Conway of Bristol City But there doesn't really seem to be anything following through on yeah. it And Matty Target, the left back for Newcastle But Eddie Howe spoke today And said that's not happening So, nothing to get excited about lads I just wanted to cool. confirm that basically <laughs> Are we having a special show at 1 o'clock in the morning Friday? Uh, what I am doing, I'm doing a a transfer window special with Anthony Joseph on Friday <laughs> lunchtime so it is right on the back of all the guys that we don't sign I'll get the story behind why we didn't a sign two, them a two minute special a two minute show eh? <laughs> uh, make, make for a quick afternoon um, there's talk of some exits I mentioned Mikey Johnson West Bromer apparently wanting to take him on loan and we know there's ongoing talks for Lager Bielka potentially to exit looks, Marco Tullio Segrist Kobayashi McCarthy Alessandro Bernabe Turnbull needs to Oh, it's all over. So bad. It's all it? over. Yeah, it was poor. You, imagine coming on 89 minutes and managing to pass everyone <laughs> off that much. Somebody dug us up saying he was only on for three minutes and you've given him a hard time. And it's like, well, <laughs> if the shoe fits. He's, um, he's not been offered a new deal. I've, I've yeah. heard that. ITK. Yeah. I've heard that. He's, uh, he's not been offered a new Quick deal. question before we round this up. What would be stronger at the end of the window than at the start? Celtic. It's Glasgow Celtic. No. It's <laughs> <laughs> plainly obvious. No, well, do you, do you see anyone? How, how many do you see coming in? It might, it might be loans. That's, I think that's the only place we're, we're, we're at now is twenty-seven plus guys with experience, but only on loan deals. We've not, with not a view to buy. We've got Nicholas Coon in just now. How many do you think will join him? What's your take? One, one. Awesome. Left back loan. Yep, a left back loan. Math. What do you think we'll get? Two loans. A pair of loans. DOS loans for those in Spanish yeah so just nothing to get excited about and I, I think that's a chat a, a big part of this window as well was making sure that you shipped out some of the dead wood and at the moment it's Quan, it's Adiguchi that's gone back to Japan and Adam Montgomery who's gone to Motherwell and got injured unfortunately so it's a hell of a window isn't it if, <laughs> if we'd hung about it I'd probably get a game yeah maybe so um, let's move on just a couple of other wee bits and bobs to catch on um We've got three tough away fixtures coming up. You know, I think most folk are aware that we've got Aberdeen on Saturday lunchtime, then Hibs at Easter Road next Wednesday, and then St Mirren in the Scottish Cup. And potentially, I know Aberdeen and Hibs aren't having their best seasons, but potentially three of the toughest fixtures you could have. And it's going to be a real test of this current squad. It is, it is, and the mood is going to be determined by what happens before. So it's over to you, Celtic. Do you think it's um, preferable to the to the players to be playing away from Celtic Park at the moment? Nah. I mean, apart from the, the fact that the surface. The tough, aye. Not, yeah. not in terms of fans or anything like that, but surface, yeah, possibly. I, I didn't um, mean surface, I meant the atmosphere. No, 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 absolutely not. You know, if, you, if you're if you playing football and you're doing well, you, you'll get the full back in it. The thing about the current atmosphere, it kind of ends on Thursday because at least you we, know. we know where we are. So, if the manager's still there, and that for me is a, 
small question. You know, it's a after the window. Uh huh. I think that's oh, really? a question. Absolutely. If he's still there, I think he'll just round everyone up in the frame and say, "This is a squad. We know the job to do. We want to stay in the Scottish Cup and we want to go on a, a real strong run in the league." And I think he'll win Aberdeen away, Hibs away, some other way. It's a total order. I ask him, do you see he's winning all three of those games? Seeing the first part of the season, we were stronger in the away games, weren't we? Like yeah. we, we handled those fixtures very well. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Hibs, I don't think so. I was Hibs last week against Rangers were one of the worst but, football teams oh, I've ever seen. But then we struggle at Easter Road notoriously, especially Rogers. I, and believe, I just I can uh, just imagine us going there. That there's some sort of shoddy record. Anyway, I've seen people making noise about it. But listen, it's tough fixtures, and and we're not in good spirits. We're, we're just not in a. I mean, can you can you? Say I don't, six I don't games think in the row, but you know, I don't think we're help. Maybe no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Uh, I tell you what, to lighten the mood, let's get your final comments, James. Tell us something, anything to cheer us up. <laughs> I don't have it. Well, just make something up. Uh, that, that that is my positivity: is that the transfer window shuts, and we've got what we've got, and we just batten down the hatches. The media are going to be all over it. I mean, I, one of the main reasons I came out quite positive on Saturday was I seen how much glee there was in the media with the negativity and I just thought well actually the game itself could have gone a wee bit better and stuff like that but the wider problem is the wider noise is, is a bigger problem yeah. but the media were just so gleeful to get stuck in bear in mind that Rangers had a, they were atrocious at St Mern am I right on? atrocious and they get the exact same scoreline and it's all rampant Rangers uh -huh. now come on yeah. it's nonsense man so that get that transfer window finished drive us towards this title Ask them your final comments for the week. Yeah, look, as much as there's been a lot of, not even negativity, I think it's just re realism. You know, we're, we're speaking facts and, and we we have to, we come and say it how we see it. Uh, but yes, we're on the back of six wins. You know, we've, we've kept a clean sheet. Um, so technically we're on good form in, in, in terms of the results. It just and doesn't feel that way. It just doesn't feel that way. But you're right, I think once the window's done, um, you know, if, if we win those three games you've mentioned, suddenly everyone in the short term will be in a much better place again. And you know, we've oops, sorry, we've we've got the we've got the previous to that we can win these games. So I wouldn't put it past us. And I think that's that's what we need now. We just need a good couple of wins and performances to get everyone back feeling good about the place again. And to quote Brendan Rogers himself, Matthew he said all he can do is win games. So to Asim's point, if we do win those games, you're in a far better place, but you look miserable. So <laughs> tell us your final <laughs> comments for the week. Hail, hail, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Keep singing the Kool-Aid. <laughs> is that it? Is that what you're uh, leaving nah, with? Listen, keep a faith. Listen, I keep a faith, bro. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, at the end of the day, when you support Celtic, it isn't just about results. It isn't. And we all know that. And we're all responsible for that because we hold the team to account and we hold the board to, to account. In many ways, <laughs> and they respond how? No, but in many ways, the reason the COVID season derailed is because we weren't in the stadium to hold the team, the manager, and the board to account. So we are in there. We have that opportunity. Um, you know, th this season's been a bit of a mad season already. You think of the stuff, the Green Brigade, the fact that even Rogers is even back at all. You know, and, and going back to the, the transfer window, the fact that we've managed to bring in a, a Swedish player of the year who's playing for the national team who fits every criteria you would imagine to be a successful Celtic signing who's been in the squad man of the match at Ibrox and is now on the way out the door scored a Champions, scored, League, scored winner. A Champions League winner it's mental <laughs> mental and yet here we are so let's just see what happens wait for Majowski playing up front for Celtic and Saturday against Aberdeen that'd, that'd be a good laugh why not? Yeah. Why not? So that wraps things up on this latest episode of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. Thanks to James Assam and Muff for joining me and our thanks to you for tuning in. We'll be back with two shows later this week so that's the countdown to kick off ahead of Saturday's game with Aberdeen as well as that two minute transfer window special with Anthony <laughs> Joseph which will be on Friday. But in the meantime as always thanks for supporting the Celtic Exchange and we'll see you soon. <laughs>